theory in discrete mathematics is the study of graph which is a mathematical structure that represents a particular function by creating a pairwise relationship between objects it is especially useful when it comes to the analysis of a network or a map to find the shortest easiest and most feasible route it also has an application in various data structure algorithm like Warshall's and Cruikshank's algorithm. So if you are interested in knowing more about graph theory then welcome to this course. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new update or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video show us some love and like this video knowledge increases by sharing so make sure you share this video with your friends and colleagues make sure to comment on the video for any query or suggestions and i will respond to your comments hello everyone and welcome to this new course on graph theory now in this particular course we are going to understand what are the basic concepts of graph theory and we are going to understand how they can be implemented in various ways so let's quickly get started so in this particular course we are going to understand what are the basic elements in graph theory what are the components of a graphs what are the various types of graphs so there will be various graphs that we will normally be seeing in graph theory and we are going to discuss them all in detail here we'll also be looking at why these graphs are different from each other so the minute characteristics of the various graphs will also be identified and discussed here lastly we are going to look at a concept of adjacency matrix and understand exactly how and why adjacency matrix is utilized so let's quickly dive in to the course so first we are going to look at the concept of a graph theory now in graph theory we first need to understand what it is and we also need to look at what are the applications that we actually have in real life as well as in computer science why do we need to do these things because it will help us understand exactly why we are studying this particular subject right so let's quickly get started so the first thing that we need to understand is that in graph theory the basic concept that we have is of graphs right so what are graphs graphs are actually a collection of points or nodes so as i've already stated there are some elements in a graph right now these elements are known as points or more commonly called nodes in a graph so node or point is a technical term and elements is just a colloquial term right now these elements or these nodes could either be heterogeneous in nature or they could be homogeneous in nature now what does this mean this means that the two elements or more than two elements which are connected with each other and forming the graph may either be of the same type or of different types so we can have say for example two humans communicating with each other this would make the two nodes homogeneous in nature on the other hand if the communication is between a human and a digital device say for example a mobile phone then this particular communication or the nodes in this particular graph will actually be heterogeneous in nature because both the elements or both the nodes in the graph are actually not of the same type right next we need to understand that graphs are actually a mathematical representation now any kind of communication or any kind of connection that is actually seen between any node can be represented in mathematics with the help of graph now graphs can be of various types you could have graphs that you can normally see you can have graphs that are like trees you can have those trees divided into binary and non binary trees and so on and so forth but one thing we need to understand very clearly is that if you have nodes and there is a connection between those nodes then it is amply obvious that it can be mathematically represented as a graph now some of the most commonly seen graphs are in the form of networks chemicals and even social interactions so networks as we already know are actually the connections between various nodes wherein the nodes would be either humans or other kinds of communication devices right so if we have humans connected to some 
mobile device and this mobile device is connected to a router and this particular router would be connected to a tower say for example then this particular depiction would also be a graph right now why is this a graph because here we've got various nodes or elements which are connected to each other so this kind of a network can also be represented as a graph next let us look at an example of chemicals we've seen various chemicals as we have studied in lower classes right all of these chemicals are actually depicted using some diagrammatic representation so for example if we look at h2o h2o is often represented as h o h so here we can see that we've got three atoms which are actually connected to each other in such a manner that it is forming one molecule so there is some interaction between these various nodes so thus we can say the diagrammatic representation of any kind of chemical is actually a depiction of a graph another example that i can give you here is c cl4 right carbon with four chlorines this is depicted in this particular manner we have a carbon in between with four chlorine atoms around it again as you can see we have five nodes and all of these nodes are interacting with each other in such a manner that you are able to form a graph of this particular interaction lastly we've got social interactions represented as graphs any kind of social interaction whether they are entertainment based interactions or they are communication based interactions can actually be referred to in the form of graphs right so any diagrammatic representation that you want to create such that it shows the interaction between various nodes and this is represented in a mathematical manner then that particular diagrammatic representation can be known as a graph next let us look at some applications of graph theory so first we'll look at some real life applications now as we've already seen any kind of interaction would become a part of a graph or would be diagrammatically represented as a graph so this means that if we've got the interaction between a start and an end point or an interaction between one tower to the next or an interaction between two or more mobile phones or an interaction between humans either via their social networking sites or via contact disease in each of these cases you can see that there are some interactions that are going on and all of these interactions can be depicted using graphs in power grids graph actually helps us determine where a particular step up or step down transformer has to be attached in order to maintain the voltage of any current that is moving from one point to the next power grid analysis using graph theory also helps us determine the the shortest and most efficient route that needs to be taken in order to transport electricity from point a to point b in a similar manner if someone is undertaking road travel an analysis of the whole graph of roads or in this case we could also call it a map of roads would actually help us determine the shortest most efficient and fastest way to reach from point a to point b in by the networking sites again as in power grids we can use graph theory concepts in order to determine and analyze exactly where a cell tower has to be placed in order to ensure maximum area coverage for that particular network provider right next social networking analysis will actually help us determine how humans are interacting with each other how far are they interacting with each other how much and how frequently do they interact with each other apart from that social networking analysis also helps us determine what is the most commonly communicated concepts about so any kind of communication that is occurring within the graph or within that particular social network interaction can be analyzed using 
graph theory concepts lastly as is the case in the ongoing pandemic we are able to trace the spread of diseases by actually analyzing how various humans who might have contracted a disease or might have been exposed to the disease are actually interacting with each other this helps us actually analyze and contract trace the disease and help us estimate the actual dangerousness of any kind of disease right so these were the real life applications of graph theory let us look at the computer science applications of graph theory computer science applications are most commonly seen in network analysis where we are actually talking about computer networks and also in neural networks so while we are actually trying to build a neural network the first point of instance that we actually take care of is analyzing whether a particular neural network is feasible or not by applying graph theory concepts next we also see various graph theory concepts in data structures so in data structures whenever you have any concepts related to kruskal's warshals spanning trees etc these are actually basic graph theory concepts that have been extrapolated and implemented onto data structures such that these graph theory concepts can actually fit into a computer programmable manner so these are how graph theory concepts can actually be applicable in the real world as well as in computer science next let us look at the components that are part of any graph now please remember that these components are important to understand because they form the basis of any and all graphs that we might come into contact with so the first thing we need to understand here is what are edges what are vertices and what is a path assume we have this kind of a graph as given here in this graph we've got various blue circles these blue circles are actually our nodes these nodes are known as vertices right so these vertices are actually named vertices they can be named as numerics as 1 2 3 4 5 or they can also be named alphabetically like a b c d and e the naming conventions for the nodes are up to you we can also have a combination of alphabets and numerals such as a1 a2 a3 a4 a5 and so on and so forth so as you can see we can name our nodes as and how we require and these nodes are known as vertices so if we look at this particular diagram i have named all of the vertices here as numerals because that was easiest for me right let us next understand what edges are edges are actually the connecting lines which exist between any two nodes of a graph as you can see these lines are such that they always connect two nodes or two vertices within the graph please note that any one edge will always only exist between two vertices you can't have one edge going through three vertices at the same time this is some very important concept as we'll see further on now here we can see that there is an interaction between node 1 or vertex 1 and vertex 2 this particular interaction has an arrow given here now what does this arrow mean this means that this particular interaction is going from vertex 1 to vertex 2 so in edges we actually have two types of edges we've got directed edges and we've got non directed edges directed edges are those that actually have arrows and non directed edges are those which have no arrows between them right so because of this we will see that there are two types of graphs too let us now concentrate on what a path is a path is very simple a path is actually the set of vertices that have to be jumped through in order to reach from one vertex to an other so if we want to move from vertex 1 to vertex 5 we can see that there is no direct path from vertex 1 to vertex 5 so we need to take a path through the other vertices which are there in between in order to reach vertex 5 right so let us see what path can be taken we can see that vertex 1 goes to vertex 
and vertex 2 can go to vertex 5. So we have one path here, vertex 1 to 2 and then from 2 to 5. Similarly, we can go from vertex 1 to vertex 3, from vertex 3 to vertex 4 and from vertex 4 to vertex 5. This is another path. So, in order to go from one particular vertex to another, a graph may have multiple possible paths. Each and every path is such that it will take you from the intended vertex to the destination vertex. Next, let's look at the concept of degree of a vertex. Now, what is the degree of a vertex? It is actually the number of edges which are incident on a particular vertex. Right? So, for each and every vertex, we would have a different number of edges that would be incident on it and that particular value becomes the degree of a vertex. Now, the number of edges that are incident on a vertex may either be even in number or odd in number. So, based upon the number of edges on a particular vertex, we can say that the vertex is either even or an odd vertex. So, this is not a defining factor of a vertex. It is just a manner of denoting how many edges are actually incident on that particular vertex, right? So, if this is my particular graph, this means that I've got six vertices in total. Let us count the degree of each and every vertex. Let us start with vertex 1. Vertex 1 has four edges which is incident on it. Please note that here, this particular graph does not have directed edges. This means that the edges will be counted twice, once for the initial vertex and once for the final vertex. This is because this is an undirected graph or a graph having a set of undirected edges. So here, vertex 1 has a degree of 4, vertex 2 has a degree of 2 coincidentally, vertex 3 has a degree of 3 coincidentally, vertex 4 again has a degree of 3, vertex 5 has a degree of 2 and lastly vertex 6 also has a degree of 2. From this we can say that we have some even and some odd vertices based just upon their degrees. As we can see, vertex 1 is an even vertex because the degree of that particular vertex is 4. Similarly, vertex 2 is also an even vertex. Vertex 3 is an odd vertex because the degree of that particular vertex is odd. Next, vertex 4 is also an odd vertex. Lastly, vertex 5 and 6 are both even vertices because both of their degrees are 2 which is an even number. This is how we are actually able to identify the degree of a vertex. Next, let us understand what the degree of a whole graph is. So, it's pretty simple. The degree of the graph is actually the largest degree of all of the vertices that are a part of that graph. So, let us consider this particular diagram here. If we consider this diagram and we quickly just calculate the degree of each and every vertex. So, the values written in red around all of the vertices are actually the degrees of all of those vertices. Now, from this you can see that we've got a lowest degree of 2 and a highest degree of 5. The degree 5 is actually of vertex 4. So, as we can understand, the degree of this graph will actually be the largest degree of the vertices in the graph. This implies that the degree of the graph will actually be the degree of vertex 4, which is actually equal to 5. So, the degree of this particular graph given here is 5. Next, let's look at a very important concept, which is the handshaking lemma. There are two important interpretations of the handshaking lemma. We will be looking at both of them here. The two prerequisites that we need to keep in mind while actually understanding the handshaking lemma is that these particular graphs are supposed to be finite in nature and they are supposed to be undirected graphs. This means that each and every edge in the graph will be an undirected edge. That means no arrows, right? So here we need to have these two prerequisites in mind. Let us now look at the two interpretations of the handshaking lemma. The first interpretation says that the number of vertices 
touching odd edges is even and the second interpretation is that sum of all degrees is twice the sum of edges we will be looking at both of these interpretations with the help of the diagram given here so let us look at the first interpretation what does it mean it means that if we've got vertices such that they touching an odd number of edges it implies that if the degree of the vertices is odd then the number of such vertices an odd degree is actually even let us identify that in this particular diagram so if we see here then vertex 2 actually has an odd degree vertex 1 also has an odd degree vertex 4 also has an odd degree vertex 3 also has an odd degree vertex 5 on the other hand does not have an odd degree if you make any other edge from 5 to any other vertex given in this particular graph you will find that the balance of the whole graph will shift this means that if you try to make 5 to have a, an odd degree then you'll end up with an other vertex that will actually get converted from even to odd degree so there is a balance maintained always so as you can see here we're actually able to identify that all of the vertices which have odd degrees are actually 4 and 4 is an even number this means that the number of vertices having an odd degree is actually even this is what the first interpretation of the handshaking lemma is next let us understand the second interpretation of the handshaking lemma so the second interpretation says that if we take the sum of all of the degrees of all of the vertices that are a part of the graph then that particular sum will be equal to two times the sum of the edges that are a part of the graph so let us first identify the number of edges that we have in this particular graph we've got 1 2 3 4 5 and 7 edges in this graph this last particular edge that looks circular in nature is actually a special edge called a loop it starts and ends at the exact same vertex but this is also considered as an individual edge therefore the number of edges in this particular graph is 7 next let us calculate the degrees of each and every vertex so the degree of vertex 1 is 3 degree of vertex 4 is 3 degree of vertex 3 is also 3 degree of vertex 2 is also 3 and degree of vertex 5 is 2 taking the sum of all the degrees we get the sum as 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 which is actually equal to 14 now how do we actually equate these two so if you read the statement very carefully here this says that the sum of the degrees is actually equal to 2 times the number of edges now two times the number of edges which is 7 will actually give us 14 which is exactly equal to the sum of the degrees as we have obtained in this particular graph so these are the interpretations and the understandings of the handshaking lemma please keep in mind that there are two very important prerequisites here first that the graph is an undirected graph and secondly that it is a finite graph this means that it does not expand infinitely in any given direction it has a certain set of vertices and a certain set of edges between those vertices next let's look at some of the most commonly seen types of graphs now why do we need to look at the types of graphs because it will actually help us identify what are the most commonly seen graphs and it will also help us understand what are the characteristics of these various graphs this actually allows us to identify exactly which graph would be most applicable for which kind of scenario within the system that we are either creating or analyzing so let's quickly get started
The most simplest type of graphs seen are actually the null graph, the simple graph and the multi graph. Now, a null graph is one that has literally no edges in it. So, as we can see, we've just got independent vertices strewn all throughout the environment. In a similar manner, if we look at simple graphs, simple graphs are those graphs that have no multiple or parallel edges moving between any two vertices. This means that in simple graphs, there would only be one edge between any two given vertices. Next, we've got the multigraph. In the multigraph, we could have more than one edge or what is also known as parallel edges as well as loops between any two vertices or from one vertex to itself. So if you do not have these kind of complex edges such as parallel edges, or loops for that matter, then it would be a simple graph. If you have loops or parallel edges or both loops and parallel edges in your graph, then it is known as a multigraph. Next, let us look at directed and undirected graph. First, let us look at an undirected graph. If this is our graph under consideration, we would say that it is undirected in nature. Let us quickly number the vertices so that we are better able to understand. So as you can see here, we've got our vertices now numbered. So what is this undirected graph? An undirected graph is one in which there are no arrows or no directions given onto that particular edge. Right? None of the edges in your graph would have any kind of arrows or any kind of indicator of how or where the edge is moving. This means that an edge simply exists between two vertices. It is not directed, thus it does not move from one vertex to the other. The edge is just there set up between two vertices. This is what an undirected graph is. So we will not be having any kind of arrows or directions on the edges. Let us understand this better by looking at the degrees of the vertices of this particular graph. Here as we can see, the degree of vertex 1 is 3. The degree of vertex 2 is 4. Degree of vertex 4 is 2. 2, degree of vertex 3 is 3, degree of vertex 5 is 2 and degree of vertex 6 is also 2. This is so that later on we can compare this with a similar directed graph. So for the undirected graph, our degrees of each and every vertex is for vertex 1, we've got 3, for vertex 2, we've got 4, for vertex 3, we've got 3, for vertex 4, we've got 2, for vertex 5, we've got 2, and lastly for vertex 6, again, we've got 2. So, now let us look at the directed graph. So, let this be our directed graph. Now, what is a directed graph? Now, as you can see from the diagram given here, all of our vertices are still the same. Even the shape of our graph has been maintained. What is different is that the edges here do have arrows or directions on them. We've got edges moving from vertex 1 to vertex 4. We've got edges moving from vertex 1 to vertex 2. We've got edges moving from vertex 2 to vertex 3, 5 and 6 and so on. So as you can see, there is a specific direction that our edges are taking. This means that for any given edge here, we have to see what the source and the destination of a particular edge is. Now, how do we find the degrees of the vertices of a directed graph? Please remember what the definition of degrees was. Now, there was a very special word that was utilized within the degree, which was that the degree of a vertex is actually the number of edges which are incident on the vertex. 
This is especially important when it comes to directed graphs. Please remember this word incident because it means that the degree of a vertex is actually the number of edges that take that particular vertex as its destination vertex. Right now, what does that mean? Let us take the edge between vertex one and vertex four. In this particular edge, we see that vertex one is actually the source, and vertex four is the destination vertex of that particular edge. So this implies that this particular edge is incident on vertex four. So it will count as a part of the degree calculation for vertex four, not for vertex one. Keeping this in mind, let us quickly find out what are the degrees of all of the various vertices that are a part of this graph. So for vertex one, we've got just one particular edge which is incident on vertex one. That means the degree here is one. Because there is only one edge here, which is actually taking up vertex one as its destination vertex. Similarly, here again for vertex two, we have only one edge that is taking vertex two as its destination. So we've got only one edge which actually is incident on vertex two. So the degree here is one. Next, let's look at vertex three. Vertex three has Two edges which are incident on it, right? Vertex four again has two edges incident on it. Vertex five has one edge incident on it, and vertex six has one edge incident on it. As a result, you can see that between a directed and undirected graph, there is a huge difference when you look at the degrees of the graph. Vertex one of the undirected graph had a degree of three, whereas here, after looking at this particular graph, which is directed in nature, you can see that the degree is one. This is because when we have an undirected graph. We take up all of the values or all of the edges that are there for that particular vertex, without any thought whether that edge is starting or ending on that particular vertex. This is because in undirected graphs there are no starts or destinations, right? For edges at least. On the other hand, in directed graph we have a start vertex and a destination vertex for each and every edge. And the destination vertex is where that particular edge is incident to. So, as per the definition of degrees, that particular edge counts for the destination vertex degrees. Next, let's look at weighted and unweighted graphs. Now, one point to remember here is that weighted and unweighted graphs can also be directed. Or undirected graphs. So it does not really matter whether the graph is directed or undirected. What we are trying to understand is what is weighted and what is unweighted. Now, what is an unweighted graph? An unweighted graph is one wherein we do not have any values associated with the graph. Please note that I have said values. Now, these values could be the efficiencies. These value could be the time taken to travel from one node to the other. These values could be the distance between one node and the next. These values could be anything. If these values are not present in any given graph for the edges of that. Graph, then it is known as an unweighted graph. On the other hand, if we have values for edges such as one, three, three, nine, five, two, as you can see, some values have been attached or some values have been associated with the edges themselves. Again, irrespective of whether the edges are directed edges or non-directed edges, we can attach values. To the edges, if there is such a case wherein a graph has values attached or associated with it with its edges, it is known as a weighted graph. Weighted graphs are most commonly seen while we actually look through routing tables or routing plans. And these are an important part of networking. 
Weighted graphs are also seen when we are trying to have real life applications in the form of power grids and mobile networks because again there we need to identify what is going to be either the cost associated or for that matter the distance between or for that matter the power of the value that is being transported between any two given nodes right so in any case there is going to be a value which is going to be associated with a given edge within the graph if that is the case then it is known as a weighted graph if there are no values associated with the edges then they are known as unweighted graphs next let us look at connected and disconnected graphs now before going forward let me tell you this is a connected graph and this is a disconnected graph now why are these called as connected and disconnected graph it is because a connected graph is one in which we can move from any one vertex to any other vertex so this means that in connected graphs all of the nodes are either accessible via direct edges or accessible via a given path so as you can see if i want to move from vertex 1 to vertex 4 there might not be a direct edge going from vertex 1 to vertex 4 but what i can do is i can follow the path 1 2 4 right similarly if i want to go from vertex 2 to vertex 3 i can follow the path 2 1 3 so it is possible in a connected graph to go from any one vertex to any other vertex without really hindering ourselves so all the vertices that are a part of the graph are connected to each other either via direct edges or via a path that is there existing within the graph on the other hand disconnected graphs are those which have vertices which cannot be connected to each other so if we number these vertices as 1 2 3 and 4 you can see that there is no way that you can go from vertex 1 to vertex 4 that is because we have one edge from vertex 1 to 3 and another edge from vertex 2 to 4 there is no path that can actually be taken in order to move from vertex 1 to vertex 4 so neither is there a direct edge here nor is there an indirect path that can be taken to move from one vertex to the other such graphs in which there are disconnections between vertices such that you are unable to move from one vertex to the next are known as disconnected graphs next let us look at a regular graph let us number the graph here as 1 2 3 and 4 so what is a regular graph a regular graph is actually one wherein the degrees of all of the vertices is the same So if we look at this particular graph then the degree of vertex 1 is 3 the degree of vertex 4 is 3 the degree of vertex 3 is 3 and the degree of vertex 2 is also 3 so as we can see the degrees of all of the vertices that are a part of the graph is exactly the same this means that this particular graph is a regular graph next let's look at what a complete graph is a complete graph is actually one wherein we have one vertex connected to all the other vertices that are a part of the graph this means that if we take any one vertex we have direct edges from that one particular vertex to every other vertex that is a part of the graph let us take this as vertex 1 vertex 2 vertex 3 and vertex 4 we have edges from vertex 1 to vertex 2 vertex 3 and vertex 4 similarly if we consider vertex 2 vertex 2 has edges to vertex 1 3 and 4 next vertex 3 has edges to vertex 1 2 and 4 and lastly vertex 4 has direct edges to vertex 1 vertex 2 and vertex 3 this means that each and every vertex that is a part of the graph is directly connected to all of the other vertices that are a part of the exact same graph such graphs are known as complete graphs next let's look at the last concept that we have in our types of graphs 
This is the bipartite and the complete bipartite graph. Now, in order to understand what complete bipartite is, we first need to understand what a bipartite graph is. Now, a bipartite graph is one wherein the vertices can be traversed from one vertex to the other, but we can split up this particular graph into two sets of vertices such that there is no set which has a direct connectivity between them. Let me explain this further with the example of this G1 graph. We are able to traverse from vertex 2 to vertex 3. Also, we are able to traverse from vertex 2 to vertex 1 and vertex 1 to vertex 3. This means that this particular graph is a connected graph, right? There is no disconnectivity between this graph. So our first condition is complete that the vertices can be traversed from one to the other. Next look at the second part of the definition of the bipartite graph. In the next part, we actually need to form two sets with the vertices that are a part of the graph. So for our graph G1, let us create two sets. Say, for example, set A and set B. And the method in which these two sets have to be set up is very simple. They've said that both of these sets are supposed to contain vertices. But the vertices should be split up in such a manner that there is connectivity between the vertices across set, but no connectivity between the elements of the set. So here they are talking about direct connectivity. If there exists a direct edge between the two elements, then existing, they should exist in two different sets. And if they are existing in the exact same set, there should be no direct edge between them. So if we look at graph G1, then we can put two and three in one particular set and vertex 1 in a complete different set. Let us see if this actually satisfies our bipartite condition. So if we look at this particular example, there is a direct edge between vertex 2 and vertex 1. So it is across the two sets. Again, we've got connectivity between vertex 3 and vertex 1. Again, it is across the two sets. But is there any connectivity between vertex 2 and vertex 3? No. In our graph, there is no connectivity between vertex 2 and vertex 3. By connectivity here, I'm talking about a direct edge between the two vertices. Since this is not the case, that means that this particular graph can be decomposed in such a manner that two sets are formed such that the elements within the set have no direct edge between them, but there are edges across the two sets, right? Let us understand this further with the other example given here, namely graph 2 or G2. Now look at graph G2. Graph G2 actually has four vertices in it. Now let us decompose these vertices in such a manner that we have two separate sets we can put up vertex 1 and vertex 3 into one set and we can put up vertex 2 and vertex 4 in another set. Observe this very closely. We have a direct edge between vertex 1 and vertex 2, which is cross set in this case. Again, we have a direct edge between vertex 2 and vertex 3, which is again cross set. Lastly, we have a direct edge between vertex 3 and vertex 4. This is again cross set. As you can see, we have no direct edges between vertex 1 and vertex 3, which are a part of the exact same set. And similarly, we have no connectivity direct edge that is between vertex 2 and vertex 4 which is again a part of the same set. This means that this particular graph is a bipartite graph because we are able to traverse from vertex 1 to any of the other vertices but there are no direct edges within the decomposed set vertices. Right? So this is how bipartite graphs are actually created.
Lastly, let us look into the complete bipartite graph. Now, what is a complete bipartite graph? It is a graph that is actually a combination of the concepts of bipartite and complete graphs. So, in complete graphs, we've said a complete graph is one which is actually set up in such a manner that we are able to have direct edges from one vertex to all the other vertices that are a part of the graph. And in bipartite graphs, we know we need to have vertices set up in such a manner that we are decomposing the graph into two sets such that interset edges exist, but intraset edges do not exist. And here we have a combination of both of those concepts. So if we look at this particular graph, we can decompose this graph into two sets. Firstly, we can decompose it into two and three. And the next set would be vertex one, five and four. Now observe these two sets. First of all things, we have clearly decomposed this particular graph into a bipartite form. And that is because there are interset edges, but there are no edges between the elements of any single set. Please observe this carefully in the graph. So again, this is a bipartite graph. Now let us look at the complete portion of this particular type of graph. So here, what we can see is if we take up any one element from any one set, this particular element is connected with all of the elements of the second set. So if we look here, we have an edge between two and one, an edge between two and five, and an edge between two and four. Similarly, if we take the other element of the set, we again have edges going from three to one, three to five, and three to four. Similarly, if we take the other set here, namely one, five, and four, we have edges going from one to two and three, edges going from five to two and three, and edges going from four to two and three. So here, each of the elements of one set are connected with all of the elements of the other set. Right? So this is what a complete bipartite graph is. One in which the vertices can be decomposed in such a manner that there are only interset edges existing and no intraset edges existing. And apart from that, each and every vertex of one set is connected with all of the vertices of the other set. So these are all of the various graphs that we commonly see in graph theory. Lastly, let us quickly look into adjacent tree matrix and how it is actually used in graphs. So adjacency matrix is actually a chart which looks like a complete matrix. This means that it has a particular set of rows and a particular set of columns. The basic use of adjacency matrix is that it gives us an analysis of all of the data about the graph in a glance. We understand what is the connectivity between any two nodes or the connectivity between the node and itself. All of these can be identified at one glance of the adjacency matrix. So the adjacency matrix is actually utilized for these kind of properties in any use case where you need to find the shortest path. This means that in most of those algorithms which actually help us find the shortest path, such as Dijkstra's algorithm, for example, we would use an adjacency matrix. Other applications where we use adjacency matrix is network analysis, finding out whether a graph is isomorphic and not, etc. Right? So let us quickly look at what the adjacency matrix actually is. So the adjacency matrix is actually a combination of the various edges and how those edges are related from one vertex to the other. The adjacency matrix always has a V into V size. This means that it always has a number of vertices into a number of vertices size. As you can see here, we've got six vertices, right? So all of these vertices are actually supposed to be set up in this table in such a manner that the first column and the first row all have all of the vertices listed on them. Next, what do we do? We identify where edges are moving from and from where they are moving. 
So the initiation vertex and the destination vertex have to be identified. So let our graph be numbered in this particular way. Let the vertices be from 1 to 6. We need to identify whether there are edges passing from one vertex to the other. If there are, then we write a value of 1 in that particular cell. If there are no edges going from one vertex to the other, we'll write a 0. So let us see how this particular graph can be translated into an adjacency matrix. First, we look at this particular cell. This cell is in the first row and the first column. This means that it is actually asking us whether there is an edge from 1 to 1. An edge from a particular vertex to itself is only possible in the case of a loop. Since we do have a loop here, we would write 1, indicating that certain, such an edge actually exists. Next, we look at 1, 2. This means that it is asking us if there is an edge that goes from vertex 1 to vertex 2. As we can see, such an edge actually exists. Thus, we'll write a 1 here. Next, we've got 1, 3. This means that it is asking us if there is an edge going from 1 to 3 and such an edge exists. Next, we've got 1, 4. There is no edge directly going from vertex 1 to vertex 4. So this particular edge does not exist. Next, we've got an edge going from vertex 1 to vertex 5 and such an edge exists. Lastly, we've got no edge going from vertex 1 to vertex 6 and that is why no such edge exists. So in this particular manner, we can find out all the other rows also. Let us do the second vertex row. Is there a edge between the second vertex and the first? Yes, as per our diagram, we can see that there is an edge between the second and the first vertex. So we get a 1 here. Next, we check whether there are any edges between the second and the second vertex itself. As we can see, there is no loop of this particular kind. So here, we would get a 0. Similarly, between 2 and 3, we've got another edge here. So here again, we'll get a 1. Next, between 2 and 4, we've got an edge. So here, we've got 1 again. Between 2 and 5, there are no direct edges. As a result, here we'll put up 0. And between 2 and 6, we do have a direct edge. And that is why we'll get a 1 here. So if we look at our complete table or adjacency matrix, then this is what it looks like. Now, as you can see here, there are actually rows and columns having the exact same values. So if you look at the row containing all of the data for vertex 1, you will see that this is exactly equal to the column containing the data for vertex 1. That is because it is the exact same vertex that we're talking about. So the adjacency matrix is actually a square table in which we set up all of our required vertices and we map out the various edges that have existed or do not exist between the given vertices. Next, let us solve two sums on adjacency matrix to understand exactly how this particular matrix works. Please keep in mind that actually the adjacency matrix can be formed for different types of graphs. And in these different types of graphs, we've got directed and undirected graphs. So based upon whether the graph is a directed graph or undirected graph, there is a slight difference between the adjacency matrix that we actually form. Let us understand that with an example. Consider this particular example given here. So here, we'll be taking this example wherein we have vertices 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and similarly we will take vertices 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 above also. Now what do we have to do here? Similar to the example we've seen previously, even here we need to find out whether an edge exists or does not between two given vertices. So what are we going to do first? First we are going to check for vertex 1. Vertex 1 does not have any edge with itself. Vertex 1 has an edge with 2. Vertex 1 has an edge with 3. Vertex 1 has no edges with 4. And Vertex 1 has an edge with 5. 
similarly vertex 2 has an edge with 1 vertex 2 has no edges with itself vertex 2 has no edges with vertex 3 vertex 2 has one edge with vertex 4 and vertex 2 has no edges with vertex 5 next let's look at vertex 3 vertex 3 has one edge with vertex 1 zero edges with vertex 2 zero edges with itself one edge with vertex 4 and zero edges with vertex 5 similarly vertex 4 has zero edges with vertex 1 one edge with vertex 2 one edge with vertex 3 zero edges with itself and one edge with vertex 5 lastly vertex 5 has one edge with vertex 1 zero edges with vertex 2 zero edges with vertex 3 one edge with vertex 4 and zero edges with itself so our adjacency matrix was very clearly made here and also very quickly made here as you can see we didn't really differentiate between going from vertex 1 to 2 or going from vertex 2 to 1 since these particular edges are undirected if they exist between any of these two vertices we simply considered this one particular edge in both the places so this is actually one of the major differences between undirected and directed graphs in the undirected graphs this one singular edge will be mentioned in two places because in one case we are considering the edge between vertex 1 and 2 and the other case we are actually considering the edge between vertex 2 and 1. Since they are undirected in nature, if the edge exists then it will be counted. Right? Let us see what happens in a similar case in directed graphs. Consider this particular graph as given. Now, as per this particular graph, we'll take the required vertices as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. While looking at this graph, we can see that if considering vertex 1, we've got one edge that moves from vertex 1 to vertex 2. Right? Can you see the difference in the way that I'm actually talking about it? When we were looking at undirected graphs, we were just looking at whether there exists an edge between 1 and 2. But now what we are saying is we need to understand or we need to determine whether there exists an edge moving from 1 to 2. So here the direction is very important. So as you can see here, there is an edge which is moving from 1 to 2, that is vertex 1 to 2. So we'll put up a 1 here, whereas there is no edge that is moving from vertex 1 to itself. So a 0 is put up here. Similarly, if we look at vertex 1, there is an edge moving from vertex 1 to 3. This means that we'll have a 1 here. On the other hand, can you see that there are no edges moving from vertex 1 to 4? So there will be a 0. Similarly, since there are no edges moving from vertex 1 to 5, there will be a 0 here. Next, let's look at the second vertex. If we were talking about undirected graphs, then we would again have a 1 here between the vertex 2 and 1. But here, the way in which we identify edges is different. We need to check whether an edge moves from the second vertex to the first. Because these are directed graphs, right? As you can see in this particular graph, we have an edge that is moving from vertex 1 to 2. But we do not have a case wherein the edge is moving from vertex 2 to 1. So since this does not exist in our graph, we are going to write a 0 here. Similarly, there are no edges moving from vertex 2 to itself. There are no edges moving from vertex 2 to vertex 3. There are no edges moving from vertex 2 to vertex 4 either. So here 2 will get a 0. Lastly, there is one edge that moves from vertex 2 to vertex 5. Thus, we get a 1 here. So now let us look at vertex 3. So, as we can see here, there are no edges moving from vertex 3 to vertex 1. There is one edge moving from vertex 3 to vertex 2. There are no edges moving from vertex 3 to itself. 
one edge moving from vertex 3 to vertex 4 and zero edges moving from vertex 3 to vertex 5. Similarly, for vertex 4, we've got zero edges moving from vertex 4 to vertex 1, zero edges moving from vertex 4 to vertex 2, zero edges moving from vertex 4 to vertex 3, zero edges moving from vertex 4 to itself and one edge moving from vertex 4 to vertex 5. Lastly, looking at vertex 5, we can say that there are zero edges moving from vertex 5 to any other vertex, right? So this is how we actually have a difference between our directed graphs and undirected graphs when we are looking at edges and symmetrices. So let us quickly just summarize everything that we have seen in this particular course. First, we've seen what graph theory actually is. And we've understood why we are using these graphs, right? So graphs are actually a mathematical representation of any kind of interaction that goes on between either homogeneous nodes or homogeneous points and heterogeneous points or nodes. Next, we also looked at the real life as well as computer science based applications of graph theory. Next, we understood the various components of graph theory. Namely, what are edges, what are vertices, what are paths. We also saw what the degrees of both a vertex as well as a graph was. We also understood what our handshaking lemma was and the two interpretations of the handshaking lemma. Next, we saw various types of graphs namely null graph, simple graph, uh, uh, multi-graph, right? All of these different types of graphs. Apart from null, simple and multi-graph, we also saw weighted and unweighted graphs. We saw directed and undirected graphs. And we also observed the difference between complete, regular, bipartite and complete partite graph. Right. We also saw the type of graph, namely the connected and the disconnected graph. The characteristics of all of these graphs would be different. And apart from our directed and undirected graphs aside, all of the other graphs that we've seen can either be directed, undirected in nature, weighted, unweighted in nature and so on and so forth. Realistically, many of the graphs are actually a combination of all of these different types of graphs. So ideally, we can have a graph which is unweighted, but directed. And at the same time, this particular graph could also be a complete graph. So what we've seen is the various types of graphs and what we've understood now is that it is not necessary that these graphs would be separate from each other. We could have one graph which is a combination of multiple graphs because it has the characteristics of multiple types of graphs. Next we saw the adjacency matrix. What was the adjacency matrix? It was like a map of which edge is being connected to which other edge in a graph. We saw that this particular map changes its shape and direction as soon as you either put it up for a directed graph or an undirected graph. So one of the basic characteristics as we observed was that in an undirected graph, we saw that the row for a vertex would be equal to the column values of that particular vertex. This is because since this particular edge is not directed, we count it both ways. On the other hand, in a directed graph, this condition would not hold true. So the row for a vertex would not be equal to the column for a vertex in the graph, majorly because in directed graphs, we are very particular in stating or in understanding that the edge is going from a source vertex to a destination vertex, right? And it is not necessary that if it goes from vertex 1 to B, then there would exist an edge going from vertex B to 1. So this is what we need to take care of. Next, we also saw that adjacency matrices are used in various places where we require shortest distance first or power grid calculations, etc. Right. So we saw two examples of adjacency matrix also one for our directed graphs and the other for our undirected graphs.
So that is it for this particular course. And I hope all of you have understood the concepts given here. Thank you so much for attending this course. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new update or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video, show us some love and like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing. So make sure you share this video with your friends and colleagues. Make sure to comment on the video for any query or suggestions and I will respond to your comments.